Hey, good morning everybody. Time for another rousing video of what's Shane T tuning today. Live today from the beautiful uh, grounds of Orlando Speed World Dragway at the uh, World Sport Compact Challenge, I think number three now, um, where I'm currently working with the team Techno Toys, uh, Nissan Silvia S15 with a four-cylinder 2.2 liter Mazworks um, Nissan engine with a turbocharger on it on methanol. We ran this engine on the dyno. Some of you may have been privy to that video. Um, and so I thought maybe we would show you a little bit about the car that contains that engine that made 1800 horsepower on the dyno. So now that Paul Yaw has had a chance to see my face, which I know he uh, absolutely can't stand, which is why I do it. I'm gonna flip the uh, video around so we can have a look uh, as soon as I work out where the flip around is. There we go. So here we are on the grounds. There's the guys. The guys all want to be part of the video, so they'll, they'll be happy. Anyway, so we've got the, the clutch out of the car. We're just servicing the thing for, uh, for round one of eliminations. We've managed to qualify in the number two position here at this race uh, this weekend. Uh, we ran uh, our new personal best speed uh, in qualifying run number two. A 655 with a 6 at 219.86 miles per hour. And we uh, came back in the, in the fourth qualifying session and, and kind of ran the same basic number, 655 with a 9 at 219.51, I think it was, miles per hour. So anyway, this is the, uh, this is the beast. It's, it's, all, it's all apart for service, like I said. We're trying to get ready for eliminations coming up later today, round one. So this is the... Uh, this is the clutch, obviously like any other clutch, it goes behind the engine and it tries to uh, uh, connect the power that the engine makes to the rest of the drivetrain. So, hey, there's Kerry Bales. We came to, see, to, we came show, to show Paul, Paul y'all our faces. faces. Oh, that's cool, that's awesome. What's up, Paul? We should, let's flip it around, we'll all have our faces. Look, just, just for Paul, we have a selfie live video moment from Orlando Speed World. So, how about that? So, in, in your face, Paul y'all. <laughs> Fuck with. Okay, so anyway, so uh, in the bell housing here, we have the cross shaft that runs the uh, the fork for the, the throw out bearing. This is the throw out bearing itself. This actually pushes on the back side of the fingers on the clutch to release it, just like any normal throw out bearing would in any kind of a car. Uh, and then we have this sensor here, which is uh, a speed sensor, picks up a magnet on the uh, input shaft and tells us what the speed of the input shaft going into the transmission is. And we can compare that to the engine speed. Uh, so that we can uh, understand how much slip we have in the clutch. We're using a, uh, a TF uh, or EZ Motorsports uh, lockup cannon. This is uh, what we call a lockup clutch. Uh, and we have this position sensor on the arm here so that when we actuate this lockup, we can see the exact position of the cross shaft and therefore the throwout bearing and know exactly where we are compared to the fingers themselves. Um, Miguel, our clutch expert, is in the car working on the clutch at the moment, so I was gonna try and take a shot of that, but I think I'm gonna have to go to the other side of the car to give you any kind of a reasonable view of it. So let's head back around to this side of the car. So, Miguel, say hello. Hi. Good job. That wasn't hello, that was hi, but anyway, that'll work. <laughs> okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the actual clutch unit itself, and this, is just like any other clutch you'd have in any other sort of a car on the road, except that it has multiple discs. So if we have a look on the top side, we can see that there's multiple discs and floaters in between this, this really complex looking pressure plate. Uh, and the pressure plate assembly has these weights on it, these bolts. Can you, can you point to where the uh, counterweight is? So these bolts go in these clutch release arms and the centrifugal force as the engine revs up, helps the clutch uh, apply even more force to clamp together and, and stop slippage. Now, this, this clutch, I said, has a lockup on it. And so what that means is that we effectively have two stages of, uh, of the uh, clamping force. We have the primary finger, which is actuated with the pedal, just like any normal clutch would be. And then we have the secondary lever. The secondary lever has a longer slot in it. And what happens is, we use the uh, clutch ram on the outside of the bell housing. It has a pneumatic hose to it. And the ECU watches uh, the position of the clutch using the sensor. 
and then we we tell the, the, the ECU where we want the clutch to be at a given point on the racetrack, and it modulates the pressure in this ram that has this arm against this arm, where this, this ram shaft runs into this arm here where that bearing is, and stops it from being able to allow that secondary set of fingers to apply clutch load or clamping force to the clutch. So that allows us to have a clutch that will slip a little bit when we, when we first let the pedal off on the starting line. And then at some point down the racetrack, we can add additional clutch as we modulate the position of this, this ram. I'm gonna try to shove it in here. Okay, so that's all the way in. And that will then allow this arm to come back based on the position that we command to allow the, the throw out bearing to move away from the finger and allow the finger and the weight on the finger and centrifugal force to apply more clutch force and make the clutch lock up where we decide we want it to lock up. So anyway, that's how the clutch works. This part of the car you've seen before, if you've seen the uh, dyno video, this is exactly what you saw in the dyno. Uh, this is a Gen 1 Garrett 88 millimeter GT55 style uh, compressor and turbine housing from uh, Tile. We have a 60 millimeter Tile wastegate. Um, obviously, Mazworks did the handiwork on the header. Um, this is, again, our SR20. It has a Mazworks racing billet block, which is there. We use the stock Nissan casting cylinder head. Uh, and then we've got all, all sorts of uh, important bits inside the engine that, that Mark's picked out, which I won't bother to bore you with, and I don't know what they are anyways. Um, we have a crank trigger down here on the crank on the crankshaft behind the balancer. There's a 60 minus two trigger wheel here. And then this is our our uh, added camshaft position sensor that's a hall effect and there's a there's a magnet spinning around on the cam gear that it picks up. Ice water to air intercooler, um, radiator for this uh, water that flows through the cylinder head, and obviously the fuel cell. We run uh, three sets of injectors on this engine. We run two Siemens DECA 220 injectors and also a single billet atomizer 500 injector. So that gives us around 11,000 cc's per minute of fuel per cylinder for this engine. On the uh, engine dyno, we were able to achieve about 62 pounds of boost. But in the race car, with this snorkel going to the front of the, the, the body, and because of the fact that the car runs over 200 miles an hour, we gain about one or one and a half pounds of positive pressure on the front side of the turbocharger. And since the turbo is a multiplier of, of pressure on the inlet side to the outlet side, and our pressure ratio is about six to one, one and a half pounds of pressure times six gives us about seven or eight extra pounds of boost that we couldn't make on the dyno. So we can make almost 71 pounds of boost at the finish line with this car that we couldn't make on the dyno. Let's see what else we have here that might be entertaining or interesting. David, say hello. Hey, what's going on, guys? That's David. He's the uh, other uh, car chief on the car. These guys do all of the uh, actual work. I get to sit inside and, and look pretty uh, and, uh, and poke the keys, so I've got the easy job. These guys have to do all the work. We use a uh, Liberty 5-speed transmission, and, and that's, the, uh, that's the transmission unit there. Um, these, this is a, a, a sort of a, a solenoid array that allows the transmission to be shifted pneumatically with air. And then the ECU, of course, controls the shifting. This stuff all comes direct from Liberty's gears, um, and we, we simply take over the shifting part of it external to all of these components. So these components exist on any, any other air-shifted uh, Liberty style transmission uh, and we just have the ECU running a solenoid instead of a button to make it shift which is really standard probably everybody with air shift has auto shift that way as well somebody making so much noise we can't talk but that's all right we have a Motex C125 dash display link it's okay if I turn the battery on I turn the power on so you can see the dash lights up it's kind of boring to see a dash when there's a no power. So there's the dash display. Uh, let's see, changes when he goes to burnout mode so that he knows he's in burnout mode. Uh, when the engine's running, it changes from a white background to a, back, a black background. That 
it does that when the engine synchronizes so that uh, in the case that the engine won't start, it gives us at least a clue without having to put a laptop on it of whether or not it sees the cam and the crankshaft sensor signals. If we saw it, uh, that the dash stayed white while we were trying to start the engine, the first thing we do is look for RPM and that'll tell us if we've got the crank sensor signal working. And if the crank sensor signal is working and the dash is staying white while you're cranking, that means it doesn't see the cam, which means hopefully we can quickly, you know, go in and plug the camshaft sensor back in, assuming that was what was wrong with it. But it's just a way to keep track of what's going on without having to have a laptop on it at the last minute. Lots of times at the races, last minute things happen and get you freaked out up on the starting line when your car won't start, um, which of course you should have started in the pit area. But sometimes things happen between the uh, pit area and the starting line. And uh, I don't know why they happen that way, but just the race cars, man, they figure out a way to break themselves sometimes without even doing anything. So uh, the taillights here are flashing on and off. That's just uh, the uh, Motec PDM is running the, uh, you know, the whole car as far as power goes. So there's no relays or fuses in the car. It's, it's all in the power distribution module that's programmed with logic to do different things at different times. So I have, uh, one of the things I have is that while the battery's on, um, the tail lights will continue to flash about every 35 seconds for one second or so and, and the only reason that that's the case is that uh, yeah, way too many times I've uh, been with a, with a car where the race car got put in the trailer at night uh, and no one noticed the battery switch was on and so the, you come to the next morning and the battery is completely dead and most of us are running lightweight uh, lithium polymer batteries and those kinds of batteries, when you run them down, you can't get them back. So of course, you take yourself out of the race uh, for one small mistake. So anyway, the idea is that with the lights flashing every 35 or so seconds, at some point pushing the car in the trailer, someone's gonna notice, hey, the battery's still on and switch it off, or at least that's the plan. Anyway, dual parachutes, uh, it, like uh, in any other car that goes over 200 miles an hour would have. This is obviously right side drive, so this is a little bit different than uh, most of the cars I'm used to working on but other than that it's pretty much standard this side of the car has the complete vehicle electronics inside of this box which was built by KSV Looms Kevin Van Cleve in Sanford uh, I'm gonna go to the other side of the car I think because it can get a better view maybe I can maybe I can have a look here at the uh, front side of this box so you have all of your inner connections there are obviously military grade mil spec wiring and the ethernet connections there which is the one i plug the cable into and make tuning changes with but i'll go to the other side of the car the idea with the uh, electronics we call a uh, jewelry box um, is just that uh, housing everything in one place uh, with vibration mounts and out of the way of things like this giant transmission that's going in and out of here just hopefully gives us a way to protect the electronics a little bit better uh, and keep bad things from happening to them, which tend to happen on a race car. Uh, the other cool thing is that all of the connections that need to go different places can be done inside of that box. And uh, therefore you don't have to try to have those connections in part of the loom that's running through the rest of the car. You can make all your connections in the box. Inside the box it can be terribly ugly and uh, no one has to see it on the outside of the, uh, of the, of the harness or inside the car. So these are the spark plugs we ran. Well, actually we've been running the same spark plugs since Maryland. So anyway, these, these have got a few different runs on them. Again, we run methanol. This is a, uh, this is actually a uh, uh, Denso, Nippon Denso spark plug. So that's what, uh, that's what we run in this, in this car. And that's kind of what the, what the plug looks like after several runs um, on methanol. We run these uh, motorcycle coils, which uh, wasn't my first choice, but but Mark actually insisted that we use them because they fit the engine so well, and actually they work really well. I'm very impressed with how they perform. We have a uh, M and W Pro Drag CDI box, and that's taking care of the ignition duties. And uh, yeah, other than that, pretty much uh, your standard four-cylinder drag race car. This is a, what they call a, uh, we run a class called Modified, and in Modified you have to have a uh, steel roof quarter panels and firewall has to be made of steel, and so what you're looking at is basically what, what once was an actual street-driven Nissan Silvia S15. Uh, and then the car has obviously been shelled other than the 
outer part of the bodywork here, which is still steel, that's the stock stuff. Uh, and it's got, at least there's frame, this uh, tube chassis like you have in any other sort of a pro mod. It's just that it has a steel body wrapped around it. And so it fits the modified category rules. So anyway, I hope that was uh, a little bit of an interesting look at, uh, at this car. We, uh, we're number two qualifier this weekend, again with that 655. So with any luck, uh, we'll be able to uh, hopefully take our performance and turn it into a, uh, turn it into a win. So uh, thank you for tuning in. If you, uh, if you enjoy this video, please, please share it. And uh, if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Facebook, Shane Tecklenburg. You can find me at Tuned by Shane T on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Tuned by Shane T, YouTube, Tuned by Shane T, uh, pretty much all things Shane T. So from the Trinidad Tobago pit area in Orlando Speed World, signing off. Again, thank you for watching.